Well, hello everybody. This is Dr. Brandy Maynard, and my students affectionately refer to me as Dr. B. And my teaching partner is here today too, and our students affectionately refer to her as Mrs. T. So Dr. B and Mrs. T. And we're so happy to be here with you today. And um, Mrs. T, Mrs. Carly Thompson, she'll be in the chat area today. So if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat area. And she will be more than happy to answer those or to um, filter them off to me as we go ahead and move along. So I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm thrilled to be talking to you about the digital native, which are students born after 1990, and how we can support them and how we can integrate technology into the curriculum. So here we go. Hold on. It is a wild ride. And I loved this picture because this picture captures a time in my life when, well, like all of us, we could ride our bike wherever we wanted. Our parents didn't even seem to mind. Um, things are different now. But when I was young, we had a museum up near our house. And I always used to go to that museum. And it was so fun. And one day, the people that ran the museum invited me to come and help to teach in their one-room schoolhouse. They had a one-room schoolhouse that was brought onto the property. And their grandchildren were coming. And my life was changed. That very Saturday, my life was changed because I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. That's all I ever wanted to do. And so I graduated from high school, went into college, took my undergrad degree, took a couple gifted and talented courses, and then moved into my student teaching. I moved into my student teaching experience just at the time that there was a gentleman in the gifted and talented program that had gotten fired. And they needed a person to fill their gifted and talented program. They chose me. I was doing some problem-based learning, some technology things at the time. And it was an experience, that's for sure. I remember my first day, it felt like I was drinking from a fire hose. All of a sudden, I was with these kids, and I thought, what in the world? Who are these kids? And how do I support them? And very quickly, I signed up for a master's program in teaching gifted and talented students through Whitworth University to figure out what it, what it was I was doing and how to do it. And then I taught in a, at the time I was teaching in a brick and mortar school. I was in that school for about five years, came to the virtual academy, and realized, you know what? We really need to create virtual gifted programs for these kids. And this was back in 2002. We were pioneers in doing this. And we just got it started taking the idea of gifted education, virtual education, and moving those two ideas together to create programming. And we, while we were doing that, we were also realizing at the time there was this tech explosion. And I know all of us have lived through that tech explosion. And all of a sudden, Technology was something that our kids were using 24-7. And so as teachers, we needed to figure out how to use it. And so at the time, I had a dear friend of mine. And her and I was very interested in those whole ideas. And she said, have you ever thought about a PhD program? I said, yes, I've thought about a PhD program. And she said, let's do it together. I said, you know, it would be really fun to do it together. I said, it'll be like girls' night out every Friday. We'll have dinner, and we'll go to class. It wasn't exactly like that. It was a whole lot more work <laughs> than I had imagined. But it was a great experience because I was able to do some research and really dig into that idea of virtual education and what makes a really good teacher for gifted kids in a virtual environment. And that's what I'm here to share with you today. The 21st century gifted learner and those that teach them. So I wanted to share my ideas with the world. And this is the first in a series that Mrs. T and I are doing um, on gifted education, parent training. She'll be doing these with us. She'll be invited to join us every week, and, or sorry, once a month. And it'll be the fourth Tuesday and fourth Wednesday of every month at this time. So this is just the first of many that we're going to be sharing with you today. So these are the students that we're teaching today, the 21st century learner. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to send us out to a video so we can see who these kiddos are and what it is that they need from us. So here we go. Go ahead and press play, and it'll work for you.
wow, those students certainly had a lot to say. And it's so nice, the situation that you're in. Glorious, actually, because I'm a professor. I do some adjunct work at Whitworth University now. And I also go out and do trainings for teachers. And what I've found is that in some of the schools, a lot of these sites are blocked. You in the home have so much power because you now can share the world with your children without any of those blocking issues, which is phenomenal. And it's, a, it's just such a gift. Feel free to use the chat area. The chat area is open to you. I want you to connect with one another. And I told you earlier that I was a professor, but promise you, I promise you that I will not get mad if you decide to pass notes in class. That's what it's there for. So that's your opportunity to, um, to connect with one another and, and just make this learning rich and make it come to life for you. All right, well, let's get started. And I have to do some theory behind this. And don't, don't leave yet. Um, there is some the why behind why we do what we do. And this is called the A plus teaching model. This is a model that I developed through my dissertation research. And I talked to you a little bit about this earlier. This A plus teaching model has been designed to share what is the very best traits of teachers. It could be an ally. And an ally is somebody who, who walks alongside their student. And really, the ally piece of it comes from servant leadership. And it requires a teacher to listen, to be aware of the needs of their children, to heal their hearts, persuade them rather than coerce them, help them to conceptualize the bigger vision with the foresight to see the smaller details, stewardship of their time, talent, and resources, building community, and committing to their growth. And next is adaptable. And when we're talking about gifted and talented education, we're referring to acceleration or enrichment. Acceleration is moving faster in the curriculum, and enrichment is going deeper. And it means differentiating the curriculum to meet the unique needs of each individual learner. So let's take a look at Bloom's higher order thinking skills and what this looks like. So here's Bloom's higher order thinking skills. And you'll see here that there's a pyramid around it. The one, the parts on the bottom, the remember section, and is number one. And that's where Bloom said that we would be spending most of our time. And as we move up these steps, least of our time, similar to what a food pyramid would look like. Now, we're doing really well as educators evaluating, or sorry, we're doing very well as educators helping to allow our students to create content. But we aren't doing as well in the evaluation and the analysis area. And when we're talking about gifted students, we want our gifted students to be up in these higher order thinking skills for five and six, but really we're not doing such a good job with the evaluation and the analyzing. And the internet is the most expensive and accessible collection of information available to gifted and talented students. Now, many of you know that Abraham Lincoln did not say that. That was actually Del Sigley. And that's why we need to teach the analysis and the evaluation skills, because we need to teach our children what is correct that they find on the internet. And there are so many wonderful resources that we would certainly not throw any of that out, because there are some resources that aren't exactly um, the best resources out there. But we just need to teach our children how to find those resources. And Dell is a guru in Gifted Ed. He teaches at UConn in their Gifted and Talented program, and really, really wise about connecting technology and gifted education. He was one of the first ones who, do, who did it. Now, when I was a kid, I used to pour over science books and encyclopedias in my parents' house. We had them downstairs, and I would go down, and I would open them up, and I would just read as much as I could. You may have students that do that as well. Give me a smiley face if you do. Kids in your own house, or even yourself, that just pour over this information. And that was me, and I used to just pour over it. And now, think about what is available to these kids that has never been available to them before. Really a phenomenal opportunity. The next part of the, of the model is the architect. And how can we create an engaging learning architecture for our students? Let's go back to Bloom's taxonomy. And I just want to flip it on its head. 
Because with gifted kids, we want to be spending our time, the most time that we can, up in the higher order thinking skills, the analyzing, the evaluating, and the creating, and the least amount of time down in here in basic cognitive skills of remembering. We want to be focusing on those higher order thinking skills. And we're doing well at applying that knowledge, like I said, with creating projects, but really focusing on analyzing and evaluating that information. And today when we're talking about word clouds, I'm going to go into what that will look like in your classrooms. Now, also the, a piece of architecture, we've got Bloom's Taxonomy, that's one piece. We also have Power Gardner's Multiple Intelligence Theory. And this is another way that we can differentiate the curriculum or change it to fit the learner. So we need to look at the lesson through the eyes of the child and design activities to match their learning experience their learning preferences. They may be nature smart. You'll know this because they like to categorize things. They like to go out into the yard and take leaves and put all of the leaves in piles based on what they look like, or rocks, or different animals. These are our nature smart kids. We have our people smart kids. They're also called our people with interpersonal skills. These are kids and people that really relate well to, one, to other people. They are the leaders in the group. They're the social butterflies. We have our number smart kids. These are the kids that really connect with math and logic and numerics. We have our picture smart kids. These are our, our artists, our visual spatial kids, the kids that can just look at something and recreate it or are very um, led and pulled toward graphic design and art. We have our, our self-smart kids. These are intrapersonal kids. These are our kids that really know the inside of who they, who they are. They like to journal. They like to spend time alone. We find that kids who are intrapersonal or sometimes introverted tend to have higher IQs, especially when we get over 160 and above in the profoundly gifted range. We have a high number of kids with high IQs that are very self-smart and tend to be more introverted. We have our body smart kids. I have one of these in my house. I've got two little boys, 10 and 5, and my 5-year-old, I cannot keep him in one spot. And you may have one of these kids too. They're really hands-on learners and love to be moving around. We have our music smart kids that can just pick up when it comes to music. And then we have our word smart kids who will do really well in games like Scattergory, Scrabble, Taboo. They really understand the English language and can pick up other languages quite easily as well. So this is what Bloom says. So when, we, when students are, when we're looking at content for students, differentiating it and allowing them to work on products and go through a process that capitalizes on these skills. Also, when we're talking about learning preferences, we're talking about three types of learners. I like to think of it as VAC, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. And as teachers, we can offer experiences in that modality or preference to these kids. And we want to teach to a gifted kid's strength. That's one of the best things that we can do. Let's, let's look at it in comparison to basketball. With our highly capable basketball players, would we be nurturing their golf skills? No, not really. They can be working on golf in their off time or the off season, but really we want to focus and nurture those basketball skills. Or a violinist, would we be nurturing their vocal skills? No, not really. Are violinists able to sing? Absolutely. But if their talent is playing the violin, we really want to nurture that talent. The next part of the model is the aggregator. And I like to think of this as the human RSS system. So somebody who goes out for that child and helps that child understand how to pull in the best resources, the best digital resources, the best print resources, the best mechanical resources or tools, and the best human resources. And that is the job of the aggregator. And then finally, the last part of the model is autonomy. So how can we prepare students for autonomy in the classroom and beyond? Preparing them so they're ready to leave the nest and fly on their own. And we're going to look at word clouds through this model today and have an opportunity to look at how we can be the best teachers for our children using these five disciplines. All right, let's start with some kinesthetic activity. Let's start with something that we're going to be using here called Answer Garden. And Answer Garden is a form of 
a word cloud. So you can just go ahead and click on the screen. You'll need to choose your pointer tool and click on the link. And the link will take you to a to Answer Garden. And once the Answer Garden opens up, it's going to ask you a question. And it says, share the words that describe your children. So just take about a minute here to share as many words as you can think of that describe your children. One and two, three word answers are the best. Let's take a minute and do that now. Now as this word cloud begins to get larger and larger, you can easily press F5 if you have a PC, or you can just refresh your browser, and you'll see all of the different words that people are writing about their gifted kids. And this is the thing about parents and teachers. When we get you together to look at these students, we may begin to find that a lot of the words that you're using are also words that others are using as well. All right, so here we go. We have all of our words. Take about, oh, five more seconds, five or ten, just to come up with one or two more words that you want to put in here. And then I'm going to show you what this tool does. Okay, as soon as you're done, join me back in the Illuminate classroom, and we will take a look at what this tool does. All right, I'm going to share my screen here, and we'll take a look at how we can take this information and, um, and turn it into a word cloud using a tool or application called Wordle. So let me go ahead and share my desktop here. And you should be able to see it, so go ahead and just give me a smiley face if you can see my desktop. All righty, perfect. All right, so here are the words that we've come up with about our gifted kids. In order to turn this into a word cloud, we're going to scroll down to the bottom where it says export. And you may do this with your kids. If you use Answer Garden or have more than one child that you're teaching, you can have them do a collaborative word cloud, and then you can export it into Wordle. So I'm going to go ahead and press export, and then I'm going to export answers to Wordle. And here we go. It's just as easy as this. So here are all the words that we came up with for gifted kids. You'll notice the larger the word is, the more people typed that word in. So then you can begin to see a relationship between words. I like to use the randomize feature. And I just merely click randomize, and it'll randomize my word cloud. So it'll go in all different directions, maybe black and white or this is called any which way, the colors begin to change. It might begin to be most of the words vertical, horizontal. So I can begin to use that randomize button to take a look at what this Wordle is going to look like. This is a very, very easy tool for kids to use. Once they've got all of their words into their Wordle, they can go up to the top where it says font, and they can change the font so it looks a little bit different. And they love this because they can be very creative. They can also choose the layout. Again, they can choose any which way. They can choose horizontal. They can choose vertical. Or they can choose half and half. I like to use mostly horizontal um, because that way, a lot of the words are easy to read. You can do this any way that you want. These can be printed, and they can also be saved to blogs or websites, all sorts of things. And we'll be talking about saving to um, other places in a little bit, in just a little bit. Let's take a look at the color. You can also choose different colors. If you want to print, I would suggest black and white. You can also choose different colors based on whatever it is that your kids are interested in. Give me a smiley face. We'll go back here to the main screen. Give me a smiley face if you think this is something that your kids might be interested in doing. I think it's something a lot of kids would be interested in doing. And we've had great success with the students in our class using Wordles as young as kindergarten. This is something that is not hard for them to do. So 
let's take a look here at what answer garden is. And I liked this wordle because it talks about what answer garden does. When we have two applications here, answer garden is a collaborative word cloud. So it allows you to work collaboratively with more than one child and for them to create a word cloud based on that information. It's at answer garden, C-H. So if you want to use it, it's answergarden.ch and you can create your own. Students use it for brainstorming. You can use it in the classroom. You can use it as a feedback cloud, if you, a feedback tool if you want to. Maybe at the end of every lesson a student creates, they use this word cloud to share all of their ideas that they got from that lesson into a word cloud format. They can create, com they can comment on each other's word clouds and it's a great way to use technology. So I would highly recommend taking a look at that. Here are some other ways that we can use word clouds. And I talked about Answer Garden. Answer Garden is the collective word cloud. Wordle is the word cloud where students will go in and create a bunch of text. They can do it from scratch. We're going to have an opportunity to do that in a minute. But let's just take a look as an ally. How can we use word clouds? So one is sharing yourself with your students and then asking your students to share themselves with one another. So they may create a word cloud that looks something like this with all of their special traits. Perhaps you ask them to, to share themselves with each other. So here's two students who have shared word clouds with one another. They can go in and find what it is about them that's alike and what it is about them that's different. This might be especially helpful when you're dealing with two students or two people. Think about taking these two word clouds that two individuals have created and comparing and contrasting them. Imagine if those two people were parent and child, teacher and student, classmate and classmate. Imagine if you, your children had gotten into an argument, the siblings, have them pull their word cloud out share their word cloud with one another and, and look at those things that they have in common so that they can really connect with one another. It might be something you want to do with your spouse. Let's say you have a little disagreement. Go back to the heart of where you started and compare with one another where you're really at and what you really are at your core. Or perhaps comparing themselves with somebody that they'd never met before. Imagine them comparing themselves with a historical figure. So they can create a word cloud about a historical figure and they can create any type of relationship that they might see between these two people. So this requires a lot of those higher order thinking skills that we talked about earlier. This is information that they really have to dig down deep to figure out. All right. So Let's take a look at an overachieving child. You can ask that child to create a list of things that they're involved in, all of those things. Create a wordle to determine, to show what it is that they're involved in. Let's say that something else comes up. Have them take that information and go over to their wordle and evaluate if it's something that's really important to them. And if it is, what's going to come off their plate? Gifted kids tend to say yes to a lot of things, especially overachievers and perfectionists. And we as parents and teachers really need to help them to, to really evaluate those things. And we can do that using this tool called Wordle. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how to create a Wordle from scratch. And all of you have the opportunity to take a look here at my screen. Let me go ahead and just do a web tour and I'll show you how to create your own Wordle. All right, here we go. So the web address that we use is wordle.net. And when you get into Wordle, it looks something like this. And then what you can do is you can press Create Your Own. And then you'll paste in a bunch of text. So now when it says Paste in a bunch of text, you can go and find, oh, I don't know, Martin Luther King's, I have a dream speech. You could find the, um, go to the two different candidates' websites and grab the text from there that says who they are and what they believe in. Paste them one at a time into this text box and press go and you can take a look at the big ideas from each one of the candidates. You could also go and um, 
take text from Amazon.com, for instance. Let's do that. Let's go to Amazon.com, and I'll show you how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and type in Amazon.com, and I may have a little bit of issue here with, oops, I see what I'm doing. Okay, let me see if I can type in here. Oh, it's not allowing me to. Let me share my desktop, and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so I'm going to go into Amazon.com, and I'm going to just type in the title of a book. Let's go ahead and type in, oh, a big one with teenagers right now is The Hunger Games. So I'm going to type in Hunger Games, and then I'm going to click on Hunger Games. I'm going to go down, scroll down here, and grab a little bit about the book description. I think I might grab it from here, because this is a book review about the book. So I'm going to grab it from right here, from Publishers Weekly, and I'm just going to press Control C on my keyboard, and that will, that will copy that for me. And then I'm going to go to Wordle.net. I'm going to go ahead and create my own, and I'm going to paste this information in and press Go. If you've read The Hunger Games, you might see some words out in here that jump out at you. Again, I can randomize this. That's the function I like to use best. A lot of students like to go in and just, um, instead of randomizing it, they'll go in and, and change those things on their own. But look, here we have a synthesis of the information from this book. You can also have students in Wordle go ahead and just create their own. And so after they've done a lesson, for instance, on a specific book or novel, they can go in to create their own. They can type the text right in here. So for instance, I'm in the Hunger Games, I might type in Hunger Games. And I might type Hunger Games in many different times. Because again, the larger the word is on the page, comes from how many times that word has been said. So I just press and type in Hunger Games. I might type in PETA and Katniss and Game. And then I would press Go, and out would come my Wordle. An alternative to some of the um, worksheets and things that students are doing at a lower level in the curriculum, this is how you can make the curriculum come alive using a tool like Wordle. Let's take a look at some other ways that we can use this. Again, as an ally, we can ask them to create a list of things that they're truly passionate about. And then when schoolwork isn't motivating and you're trying to just deal with that motivation issue, they can go back to that list or you can go back to that list and somehow take what they're working on in the curriculum and put it into the theme of motorcycles or Legos or the Hunger Games, or whatever it is that they're passionate about right now. Brainstorming ideas for papers, I see that coming through. Absolutely. This is an excellent brainstorming tool. Perfectionism. Now, this is a big one. And I got this idea from Mrs. T, actually. What she recommends is to have students create almost like a number line. And on the right-hand side of the line are huge events in the student's life. So the death of a parent, the death of a pet, um, breaking their arm, those things that are really big to them. And on the other side, the left side, things that aren't such a big deal, like um, stubbing your toe or like um, maybe a friend being mean to you. That might fall in the middle of the list. So they're creating a timeline of what would be the larger things, the bigger things in their life, and the smaller things. They can create a Wordle that does this as well. So if the death of a parent is a huge one, they may write death of a parent 10 times, death of a pet 7 times, stubbing their toe 1 time. And then they can create a Wordle with all of the things in their life based on relative importance. The bigger things are most important. The smaller things are least important. And then when something happens, like their pencil lead breaks in the middle of a test, and that is a huge deal because we know that gifted kids tend to be very, very sensitive. We learned that yesterday with Mrs. T when she was talking about oversensitivities, Dabrowski's overexcitability theory. When they're very, very sensitive about their pencil breaking, you can pull out that wordle. You can have it right there in their teaching area. And you can say, honey, where does this fall 
in the whole scheme of things. And then help them to really take a look at it. It is a big deal to them, but help them to take a look at it through your eyes, like you would do to yourself when you're just talking yourself through something. We can do that with our kids as well. All right, so what we're going to do now is we are going to use an application called Google Forms. And we're going to type in some information into this application. And I'm going to have Ms. T type this into the chat area so you have the link. And when you get there, it's going to ask you two questions. Which trait are you focusing on? And you're going to select Ally. And how would you use word clouds to engage learners focusing on the traits above? So we talked about you as an ally for your student. How would you use Wordle to support that trait as an ally. Go ahead and click on that link. It's a Google form. You can fill it out as many times as you want to. We're going to take about two minutes to do this right now. So please fill in your ideas. And then after the workshop is over today, we're going to have a list of ideas of ways we can use Wordle in all five of the different areas. So take two minutes right now, please, and work on how you might use word clouds to engage learners focusing on the trait above, the ally. This is the social and emotional side of gifted and talented kids. Remember, if you have more than one idea and want to fill it out more than once, feel free. I put a link to the spreadsheet in the chat area. So as we take the next minute for people to fill that out, feel free to click on that link and see what other people are writing. All right, if everyone could come on back, back to the main room, there is some amazing thinking happening across the nation right now. If you got a chance to take a look at the, the spreadsheet, you have some phenomenal ideas. And at the end of today, you can take this, um, you can take this information and you can put it um, you can I'm sorry, I got a little bit distracted by the chat. I, I I always try not to take a look at it because when I do, it gets me distracted. But that's okay because I loved what you had to say, Sarah, um, about her daughter using Wordle today at 1.30 for an Abraham Lincoln report. So it just made me smile inside and then I got a little bit distracted. <laughs> so anyway, but um, what's going to happen is at the end of the day, you're going to have a list of all of these ideas from all of the great thinkers within our schools across the nation. And how phenomenal is that going to be? These are people, parents and teachers, that are in your boat. They are working with gifted and talented kids, and they'll give you some ideas that you can use later today and even tomorrow. So let's take a look at the adaptable piece of this. Again, going back to the model. And you'll notice down here that I, in, on some of these slides, I've put the words. These are just different things that you can jot down if you want to go back in um, to Google or whatever your favorite search engine is and search for the words. This is kind of, these are the ideas in Gifted Ed that I'm talking about. So if you see those blue words at the bottom of the page, you'll know that. But prior to the unit, you can ask students to create a Wordle using all everything they already know. And this will help you with curriculum compacting. So if they already know what's in the unit, they can sit down. They can even do a little bit of research ahead of time if they don't want to do the unit on um, bugs, for instance, because they've been studying bugs their entire life. Have them go through and look at the objectives that are in the unit, and then have them write everything that they know about bugs. Just one, one or two words on the Wordle. And have them write as many of those words as they can using one or two word sentences, not even sentences, one or two word phrases, and then have them hold that wordle in their hand and verbally tell you about the content. If they can do that, they can go back and mark that unit off and then either one, accelerate through the curriculum, which means go, go faster, or two, go deeper, so study bugs at a deeper level or actually even three, study something altogether different. Let's say that they are really into writing their own novel. They would basically be buying the time that they would be spending about bugs to write their novel. And that is absolutely acceptable. And another piece of adaptability, this is a KWL chart. Teachers use this all the time. What do you know? What do you want to learn about the topic? And how do you want to learn the topic? Have them create a KWL chart, one wordle about what they know, 
just like they did with bugs. The next one about what they want to learn. And then the third, when it's all over, what they learned about the topic. And you can do this by unit within the curriculum. Another one is asking students to create a Wordle with different forms of assessment they would like to try. So having them create a Wordle based on their learning preference. Let's say that they're very visual. They may want to create a cartoon about what they've learned. Maybe they want to make, maybe they're hands on, they want to do a diorama or a mobile. Maybe they want to write a report. Or maybe they want to go out and do a photojournalism piece on rocks if that's what they're studying in the curriculum. Have them create a Wordle with all the different ideas of different forms of assessment they'd like to try. And then when they're working through the curriculum, if they get to something and the activity doesn't fit them, or they would like to show what they know in a different way, have them go to the Wordle, decide what it is that they want to do, and go out and do it. We talked before about um, Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. And just keeping this in mind with our kids. And again, this is with the assessment piece. And this is with the process piece as well. So when we're looking at differentiated instruction with gifted kids, we're looking at three things. The content, what they're learning, the process, how they're learning it, and the product, what they create. You can look at this through the lens of Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory, and you can create a process that requires them to use their strengths. So for instance, if they're learning about bugs and they're people smart, maybe they want to call grandma and grandpa and tell grandma and grandpa everything that they've ever known about bugs. Or maybe they want to go to a local college or a science center that has information about bugs and talk to an expert. Maybe they want to go online and talk to an expert. Maybe they want to write a journal article about bugs because that's something that they just want to reflect on and really spend time with. Maybe they want to go outside and collect different kinds of bugs and create a bug collection. Maybe they want to write a song about bugs and share that song on the internet. Maybe they want to write as many words as they could think of about bugs and then create a word search that they can then put out to other kids. Or do a photojournalism project again about bugs using products and applications like Ed Animoto. That's an excellent one that we're going to be learning about here in the next few months that they can create high quality products that no longer look like a child had done them about areas that they're passionate about. Think about a lesson that you taught this month. And then what, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our spreadsheet, back to that form. And we're focusing now on the one of two, on either adaptable or on the architect. So you can choose one of those two areas. I'm going to have Mrs. T type this into the chat area. And then what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about a lesson that you taught this month. So for instance, let's say that you taught about, like I just shared, about bugs. Or maybe you taught about a specific artist. Or maybe you taught about a time period in history. Or maybe you taught how to do verbs. Whatever it was that you taught from the curriculum, think about the area that your child is smart, or even your children, and share with us how you might incorporate Bloom's taxonomy into that lesson. So you would go ahead and click Adaptable or Architect. It would fall under either one or both. And then you would share with us um, the lesson was on bugs, and this is what I might do for a word smart kid, or a self smart kid, or a nature smart kid. Let's take three minutes to think about this. Let's go to that Google form, and let's fill in some ideas for one another across the curriculum about different ways that we might incorporate Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences into our teaching. There are some phenomenal ideas coming from people all across the nation. I have got, gone ahead and typed in the link to the spreadsheet. So if you get done a little bit early and want to take a look at what other people have written and other ideas, feel free to do that. All right, everybody, come on back to the main room. You guys have done some phenomenal thinking. The 
ideas are amazing that you have come up with. And let's go ahead and take a look together at what some of what these ideas are. So let me go ahead and just do a screen share here, a quick web tour. And we'll take a look at this Google Doc. And again, this is called Google Forms. It is one of the things that we will be learning about in the coming months. So it will be one of our technology tips and tricks and tools that we're going to be focused on. What I think I'm going to do is I think I'm just going to share my desktop. I'm having few troubles here with, um, with trying to do the web tour. So let me go ahead and just share out my desktop. And we'll take a look at what this looks like. All right, here we go. Give me a smiley face if you can see this, all right? And I'm thinking you may not be able to, that it's not quite wide enough. So give me one more second to share a different part of my desktop. And then we will take a look at what this looks like. There we go. OK, thanks for being patient with me. I really appreciate it. Let me go ahead and put the link in here. And here are all the ideas that people have come up with. And the cool thing about Google Forms is that you can go ahead and sort or filter these ideas. So let's say that you, you wanted to filter this line. You could press the Filter button up here. And then you can select only the traits that have to do with, let's go up here. here. Oops, I think I'm having some trouble because everybody is on at one time. But when you filter it, you could look at just the ally. Let's say that your kid really needs to work on some of those social emotional things. You can either sort and just take a look at the ideas for ally, or you could filter and just take a look at the ideas for ally. So there are just some phenomenal ideas that are that are on this spreadsheet. And feel free to input any as they come along. So if you get into the curriculum and you think, ooh, I've got a really good idea for one of those five, please go ahead and feel free to share that out with us. We would love to hear it. All right, well, we have just about 10 more minutes left with each other. So let's take a look and add a little bit more to our sheet. So the aggregator, the aggregator is the person for their child who reaches out and grabs different resources, so digital resources, the best of the best that's out there with the web. Print resources, this could be journals, magazines, books, mechanical resources, this could be tools like binoculars, compass, um, any tools that students need to do their work, and then human resources. In gifted education, a huge human resource is you as the teacher. And then another one is your cooperating teacher. It could be a person who is older than the child, um, a classmate. One thing that I like to always share is an idea that I have. You can go to the local high school. And you may be familiar. Some of you are probably in National Honor Society. National Honor Society, in order to be a member, you need to have a certain number of community service hours. You could go to the local high school, talk to the principal, and find out if there's somebody in the National Honor Society that has the same passion area as your child. If you can find a person like that, generally a junior or a senior, so they can drive to your house, you can set up a time that they can come after school, maybe once a week, and meet with your kid and talk about math. Talk about architecture. Talk about graphic design. Talk about those things that they are really, really interested in. And it's in the comfort of your own home comfort and safety of your own home. Again, juniors and seniors are generally the best um, because they can drive. Seniors tend to be a little bit more busy. But hopefully, that's something that you might want to think about um, in the future if you're looking for a mentor for your child. Let's go ahead. I'm going to have Mrs. T type this in one more time. We'll think about a lesson that you've taught recently. It could be the one that you just thought about. It could be something that you know that you're teaching. And then go ahead and select Aggregator and share with us where you might get some resources for this specific topic. So for instance, if the topic is Rome, I noticed that somebody was studying Rome, where can you find the best resources for Rome? I don't need websites, but you could write, I could, um, 
I could find videos about Rome. I could find somebody who's traveled to Rome before. I could go to a local travel agency and talk to a travel agent about Rome. I could get on Skype with someone from Rome and talk about their town, talk about their country. So you can, you can come up with resources that your student can use when studying a specific topic. So let's go ahead and take about two minutes right now. Go ahead and go to that link. Select Aggregator and talk about how you might share or find the best resources in one specific subject that you've either taught with your child or will be teaching in the future with your child. Let's take two minutes and you may do that now. Oh, I've noticed that it says adaptable twice, but there's no aggregator. Go ahead and just select adaptable. That will be just fine. And what I can do, because it's time stamped, I will, I'll be able to go in and change those um, so it will say aggregator when you go back later on today or another time to access that spreadsheet. I see some phenomenal ideas coming in for Aggregator. Go ahead if you are finished and would like to look at what other people have written. In the chat area is the link for that. And we're going to come back here in just about one minute. All right, go ahead and come on back to the main room, if you will. And we are just about ready to end today. And I want to share with you um, something that I think is going to be one of the most powerful things in the life of your child. So go ahead and come on back and talk to me about the 80-20 rule. In the chat area, go ahead and type in, what does the 80-20 rule mean to you? All right, so we have got some answers coming in. The 80-20 rule, I always think about it in terms of my closet. I wear 20% I wear, um, of the clothing in my closet. So I have all of the clothing in there, but I wear 20%. Somebody said, 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. There's all different kinds of ways to think about this. Google has a way that they think about it. And they take the 80-20 rule and they do something with all of their employees where they allow them to use 20% of their work time to work on a project that is exciting and interesting to them. So for instance, in a work week, We've got five days of the week, Monday through Thursday, all of the employees are working on projects for Google. On Friday, they get to work on projects that will benefit Google, but they're passionate about. So think about that with your own kids. How can you design school in a way that 80% of the time they're working on content area that's required of them, and 20% of the time they're doing independent study? And that's one of the best practices in gifted education is independent study. So think about what that would look like in the life of your child. And just go ahead and tuck this website away. I'm actually going to just take us there very quickly so you can see what it is. And it's the W-D-Y-L stands for What Do You Love? Do you love .com. And if you put in www.wdyl.com, what do you love? I'm going to put in gifted kids and click the heart. And what Google does is it aggregates together all of the information on the web about gifted kids. And then it will create a page for me about these kids. Imagine if your child loves Legos, what this would look like for them. Or if your child loves um, Rome, or your child loves, it could be anything that they're interested in. It could be math. And basically what it does is it goes out and it creates a one-page aggregated um, collection of what it is that your child loves. And I'm going to take us, and I'm going to show you what this looks like because it just did not do justice for us by doing it like this. So it's www.whatdoyoulove.com, W-D-Y-L. And I'm going to go ahead and put in Gifted Kids. And I'm going to click that button. And you'll see here what happens. 
and it looks like there's errors on the page. You're going to have to do this on your own. I'm having some issues with my computer right now, but it will get, create what looks like a magazine cover with all of these different things that your child or you might be interested in that you love. I'm going to end today by sharing two more things. One is home fun. You do have a little bit of home fun that you're going to be working on before our next class. And this is to help your, create, your learner create a word cloud outlining ideas for how they'd like to spend their 20% of school time. And then the best thing that you can do as a parent is to honor that time. So give them the time that they need in order to do things that they're very passionate about and then honor that time so they have it. I do want to send you out and off today with a video, a video that I think you're going to like a lot. I will be around for questions after we play this video, so know that I'm going to be staying if there are any questions at all. If you would like, um, now would be a very, very good time, appropriate time for your children to come in if they're close by and you'd like to call them in because this is a video I think that they will like as well. I'm going to go ahead and just put this video into the chat area. Please go ahead and click on that video. And really the video to me is about one change. If you could make one change in the life of your child, think about the domino effect that that will have. Go ahead and click on that video when the video is over. I'll be back in the chat room for any questions that you may have. And I will talk with you soon. Now, I see the video is ending for most of you. Um, yes, that I see that for Jackie, that was so much like her son. And last night, I sat down with my kids as I was preparing for today. And I said, you guys want to watch this really cool video? And they said, sure. And so we sat down. We watched it six times last night because they were so excited about that video because they love making inventions of their own. So I know what it's like to parent a gifted child. I know what it's like to teach a gifted child. And I know that together with all of us, with all of the knowledge that's here inside of these virtual academies, we can really change the lives of our students one child at a time. So please sign up for our newsletter, and it's at www.giftedresources.com. We were, we're going to send out every other week tips, tricks, and strategies that are delivered directly to your email for free. So you can go to giftedresources.com and sign up for our newsletter. We will also be sharing the recorded link, um, the recording of this video through the newsletter site. So you'll have a recording. It will be recorded. It was recorded today. And then if you want a more social experience, please join us on Facebook. We have we have 125 parents and teachers and people who care about gifted kids on there right now. and we're sharing with one another ideas that come up. Maybe you have a great site that you went to and you want to share that resource with parents. Please join us on our Facebook page because we want to hear from you. We want to hear what's going right in your world, maybe what's not going so right, and we want you to have a place that you can support one another and that we can support you. So Mrs. T and I will be back next month and we will go through your gifted coordinators in your school to let you know when those trainings, when that training will be. It's always the third week, or sorry, the fourth week of the month at the same time that this training started. I want to thank you again for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming. And on our Facebook site, I will be posting the link to the spreadsheet. So if you need that link so you can go back and get some ideas from your wonderful colleagues, that's where you can find them. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a wonderful, wonderful week. If you have any questions at all and want to take the microphone, go ahead and just press talk and we'll answer any questions you have. Um, or you can feel free to type those into the chat area. Fonda, go ahead.
You know, I don't, I, it's not that I don't have sites for high schoolers. I have lots of sites that they can go to. Um, what I'll do is I will put, I will put together um, just a few of my favorite sites. They're already on the Idaho page. So if you go to giftedresources.com, click on the Idaho section, and you go down, down Toward the bottom, it has a links page of links that we use most often. I would start there. And then another site that has a lot of information is hoagies.com. And she's the mother of a gifted student. And I typed it into the chat area. It's www.hoagies.com. And that's a site with gifted resources on it. And that will definitely have places you can go for high school students. And any of the resources that we have here, for, that we're going to be sharing over the coming year, you can definitely um, use those with your high school kids. Fonda, thanks for bringing that up. I will also um, take a look and I'll share out some of my best resources that are on my bookshelf right now for brain teasers and I'll include that in the newsletter. So please sign up for the newsletter. <laughs>